السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه الحمد لله this is the 96th session of سيرة خاتم النبيين صلى الله عليه وسلم where we are going over uh, the life of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in detail إن شاء الله تعالى and we've been talking about the hadith of ifk the incident of the slander against our mother Aisha anha and inshallah today we should be able to wrap it up wrap up the talk about this inshallah ta'ala so last week quick review inshallah we talked about how Aisha anha was continuously crying uh, because of the the heaviness of what has been said against her and because the shows against her uh, again her uh, innocence and uh, her crying because how dare people talk like this how could they say such a thing about her and she knew that she was innocent and we talked about how um, an Ansari woman came in to visit her without saying any words to her she just came in said salam and started to cry with her and we talked about the you know the importance of sharing um, sorrow and grief so for example like when someone passes away in a family then we do ta'ziyah we go and do ta'ziyah the family go visit them uh, it's, there's no amount of words that we could say to put their hearts at ease, but just to show that, show that we're sharing your pain, sharing your sorrow. So that's really rewarding to go and visit someone, for example, in that case. If someone is sick, for example, we talked about the hadith where uh, Rasulullah uh, told us that if you visit someone in the morning when they are sick, so Iyadatul Murid, when you go and visit a sick person, a marid, a sick person, then you do in the morning, 70,000 angels are appointed for you to make dua on your behalf until the evening. And if you do in the evening, then all the way to the morning to Fajr, these 70,000 angels make dua on your behalf. So um, again, the importance of that, inshallah, visiting and, and helping each other when someone is in a time of need. Now, we also talked about how uh, Rasulullah Wasallam in that condition, while they were sitting there, and they were uh, the Ansari woman is visiting, and the parents were also there present. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he comes in, and he sits with Aisha radhiallahu and uh, it's mentioned that Aisha radhiallahu says that basically he did not sit since the beginning of this if since the beginning of this incident, and this is the first time. Now one of the reasons could be that Allah alam, but. Uh, for example, Rasulullah saw that she was sick. She had a fever for over a month. And then when she found out about the, uh, the ifk and what was being said, her fever came back. Even though she was feeling a little better, she f- fell sick again. So Rasulullah did not uh, you know, ask her anything. He didn't uh, interrogate her. He didn't ask, he didn't push at her. He just w- waited until the right moment. And then when she was... Uh, in the house, uh, the Prophet ﷺ came, and along with the parents were sitting there. And Rasulullah ﷺ, we talked about how he says to her that if you are innocent, then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will absolve you, inshallah, of this slander. But if you have uh, made a mistake and you have done a, uh, you know, al mamta, meaning that you have slipped into a sin or you have done something wrong, then just seek tawbah and repentance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you. So Aisha radhiallahu anha, looking to her parents to respond on her behalf, she asked her mother, Umm Rahman radhiallahu anha, can you respond on my behalf? And she says, I, I swear I have nothing to say. I don't know what to say to the Prophet sallallahu then she turns to her father. She says, Abu Bakr Siddiq, can you respond on my behalf? And he says the same, that I have nothing to say. I, have, I don't know what to say. How can I respond to the Prophet Sallallahu So Aisha anha, even though uh, she was young of age, she says that and I spoke up. And we also talked, she mentioned how her tears stopped. As soon as the Prophet Sallallahu said these words, she was crying. And then she said, my, ear, my, my eyes dried up. My eyes dried up. My tears dried up. And then she spoke, uh, and uh, spoke up, and she says to the Prophet Wasallam that basically, you know, I, I know what people have said, and I know that it has taken its place in your hearts. And if I uh, say, if I if I uh, claim, or if I say that I haven't done something, you will not believe me. But if I uh, accept and say that I did something that I know I didn't do, and Allah knows I didn't do, then you will surely believe it. So she said this, 
and uh, uh, when the Prophet uh, uh, as, as, as after he heard this, uh, soon after that, the Prophet uh, received wahi, received the re- revelation. And we talk about how wahi revelation did not come down when the Prophet wished. There's many examples of this. Uh, you know how uh, the Prophet would wait. For example, when when he was asked from the Yahud that uh, uh, give uh, tell us about the ruh, tell us about the soul. Okay. Uh, also, Surah Kaf, for example, when um, the, when the Prophet was asked about it, and a few days passed when the revelation did not come, and the Yahud started actually even making fun of the Prophet and saying, "You have no answer. You didn't respond to us." And then the revelation came down because the Prophet had forgotten to say, "Inshallah." That inshallah I'll tell you tomorrow. So because he forgot that, the revelation was delayed. Okay, and uh, so again, this is another example where the Prophet uh, had he been making up the Quran like the Kuffar um, claim, then the Prophet would have surely, after one or two days of people making a slander against his wife, he would surely just make it up something and said, okay, she's innocent. But 30 plus days passed, and then the Prophet was given the wahi. So again, this is another proof for the miracle of the Qur'an. Now, Rasulullah sallallahu uh, the wahi is revealed, and Aisha radhanha, when she's narrating this part of the hadith, she says that, I, I swear I didn't think that I had that much importance in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that actual ayat will be revealed. She said, at most, I thought maybe the Prophet will see a dream, and then he will see, uh, you know, I'll be absolved of, my, uh, of the sin, uh, and my innocence will be basically shown to everyone. But she said that I didn't think that Quran will actually be revealed from the from the heavens, from uh, from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So, the ayat that were revealed were for, from uh, Surah Nur, ayahs number eleven to twenty. So ten complete ayat, that's almost two raku, two two raku of um, of the Quran was revealed. Uh, in relation to this this incident and absolving Aisha anha from any sin and showing her and also telling the, the you know the uh, basically teaching a great lesson uh, to the Muslimin uh, about these types of things so that it doesn't it doesn't happen in the future again. So uh, this ayah where Allah Subhanahu starts from ayah number eleven where Allah Subhanahu says Audhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. <coughs> إِنَّ الَّذِينَ جَاءُوا بِالْإِفْكِ عُصْبَةٌ مِّنْكُمْ So starting from there, going to the 20th ayah. Now, going, continuing on from the same hadith, uh, Aisha radhal anha, she says that when these ayat were revealed, and it was clear that she was innocent, uh, there was, uh, we know that one of the sahaba, uh, the one, actually the mother of the sahabi, who told Aisha radhal anha what people were saying when they went out to use the bathroom, uh, the mother of Mistah. So Mistah, he was one of the Sahabi, he was, a, he was a, a sincere Sahabi, and he was one of those who had fallen into this, um, uh, spreading this, this lie and this slander. So Abu Bakr Siddiq, he used to spend on Mistah. He would spend on Mistah. Uh, so he says that, uh, I swear I will stop, I will not uh, spend on him anymore. Wallahi la unfiqo ala Mistah. Shay'an abada. So he says, I will not spend on him after this. So whatever he said about my daughter, Aisha Radha, and he spread about, about my daughter, I swear I will not spend a dime on him in this in the future. So again, Mistah Radha, one of the Badriyeen, people who were in the Battle of Badr, he was very poor, and Abu Bakr Radha would give him a monthly stipend. He would basically give him sadaqa charity to help him out, and he was a relative also. So uh, being poor and being a relative, again, he has doubled uh, the right. So Abu Bakr Adhan would pay him a monthly uh, you know, donation or money for to help him. And he says that, I swear I will not give him a dime after this. And this is because of what he said against my daughter. And then the ayah was revealed where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And to the end, rahim. this ayah was revealed basically that the people who believe, they should not uh, you know, swear against doing good. They should not stop from doing good. And Abu Bakr radha after this, uh, you know, like, don't you want to be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So Abu Bakr radha he says, Bala wallahi inni la uhibbu an yaghfir Allahu li. So he says, I wish that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be forgiving for me. So he went back. فَرَجَعَ إِلَى مِسْتَحْ أَنَّ فَقَتَ الَّتِي كَانَ يُنْفِقُ عَلَيْهِ 
So he went back to giving him the monthly stipend. Okay, even though the Mistah had said what he had said, and it was against his own daughter, but Abu Bakr hearing these ayat, he paused and he went back on his uh, on his uh, oath, and he basically started giving back, giving to giving the nafaqa, giving him the stipend or the charity that he was giving him. So this is also teaches us the. I'm sorry. She meant something about Allah. That one? Yeah, she said. Yeah, she said that basically I don't have anything to say except the father of Yusuf alayhi salam when he said that. Ala ma tasifun, fa sabrun jamil. Wallahu al musta'an ala ma tasifun, fa sabrun jamil. So he said. So that was what Aisha Allah anha responded to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Uh, so going back, so we said that Rasul, uh, Abu Bakr uh, he went back and this shows us how much taqwa and piety that the Sahaba had, that as soon as they would hear a verse of the Qur'an, or they would hear a hadith of the Prophet uh, against something that they were doing, they would fix up right there. They would fix what they were doing wrong, and they would go back to the Qur'an and Sunnah. So Allah give us tawfiq, inshallah, to understand this and also implement that in our lives. Um, in the hadith, uh, uh, Aisha anha continues to say, she says that that uh, Zainab bint Jahsh, an, and this is one of the proofs that the ulama use, that this was actually after Khandaq, that this took place after Khandaq, because uh, Zainab anha, uh, was married, uh, you know, basically after Khandaq. So that's why... Um, uh, married to the Prophet after Khandaq so that's why they used this that Zainab was also asked and she being one of the wives of the Prophet at this time she was asked also asked about Aisha and she says that um, uh, like she was asked what do you say, what do you say about her or what do you know about Aisha and she says Ya Rasulullah ahmi sam'i wa basari wallahi ma alimtu illa khaira so she says that I am I'm going to protect my ears and my eyes, meaning I'm not going to go into this matter, I'm not going to listen to what people are saying, I'm not going to you know, talk about this and, and, what, and what not, I'm going to stay away from this. And wallahi, I swear by Allah, I don't know anything but good about Aisha. Radhanana. And again, this shows, because remember they're co-wives, and how co-wives, the chance they would have anything to say against the other wife, they would try to use that, right? But... In this case, Zainab anha, because of her wara and because of her taqwa, uh, she did refused to say to even make up anything because she was fear, fearing Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So she, um, she, Alhamdulillah, uh, she protected herself from falling into the sin. Uh, but Aisha anha says that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala did protect her from that. But she says that her sister, her sister Hamna bint Jahsh anha. She was a Sahabi, sincere Sahabi, but she actually did was one of those who were uh, who got caught up into uh, in spreading the slander. And here in this hadith, Aisha Anha says, "Watafiqat uqtuha hamna to haribu laha, fahalakat fi man halak." So Aisha is saying that it could have been maybe because of her sister being a co-wife of the Prophet Now the sister wants to. You know, defend her sister and basically one up her sister by saying something against Aisha Adal Anha. Allah Alam, but uh, you know, the intention, but she did, she was one of those who was caught up in this, um, uh, in this, in this uh, spreading of the slander. Now, learning about the slander and then the ayat coming down, uh, we know that from Surah Nur, there's actually uh, before these ayat, so the first nine ayat talk about uh, zina and how to deal with. Uh, zina, like if it's if uh, someone uh, is caught doing uh, adultery or zina, and um, one of the things that's mentioned is that four witnesses have to be have to be brought. Four witnesses have to clearly see the act, uh, and then then their basically their gawa, their gawa or their shahada will be taken. Their witness will be taken, and uh, it's also mentioned that if anyone, if it's any less, if it's two or three. Okay, or they're not sure. First, they claim that yes, they were doing zina, and they went to the court or they go to the judge and they claim this, and then later on they're like, you know, we weren't really one hundred percent sure or whatnot. There's actually a punishment that will be given to those people. This is called qadh. Qadh means to uh, to slander someone or to basically make a false accusation against someone. And uh, the had of qadh is that they will get eighty lashes. 
So there's two parts. So number one, they'll get 80 lashes, 80 uh, times that we hit with the whip. And then number two is that their shahada, their witness, will not be taken, their testimony will not be taken until the end of their life, meaning until, the, uh, until they pass away. So the ulama talk about this and they say because, you know, the, the crime that's being dealt with, zina is a, is a huge crime and it's very severe with negative effects not only on the family but on society as a whole. This is a huge thing and uh, the, the punishment also is, is so severe. The punishment because a person is stoned to death because of that. Uh, and I'm not saying as it's not not just, I'm saying severe as in it's a, it's a top, you know, for example, if someone uh, steals, one, uh, and again, this is, uh, you go into the books of uh, fiqh and stuff and it's up to the judge, but for example, a person's hand will be cut. Or, you know, there's different levels, lashes, uh, hand be cut, and then if they do uh, something else, that you know, the opposite hands will be, uh, sorry, the hand and foot will be cut, for example, and different things like if they do different different crimes. Uh, in this case, for zina, for adultery, uh, it's stoning to death. So because the person's life will be taken, you know, this is, needs solid proof. So that's one thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down these ayat, that four witnesses uh, will, be, will be needed. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, Islam protects people from you know doing things and they can just openly do things uh, again the ulama mentioned that if it's something less than that for example if someone was um, caught kissing for example or, or doing something with with a non, uh, non-mahram woman or something like, or vice versa or whatever uh, if a person witnesses went to the judge and they told him that we saw this and that uh, something less than zina then the judge if it's proven that they were actually doing that, they could be given punishment, which is less severe, as in stoning, but like, for example, whips, uh, lashes, or being put in jail or whatnot at the discretion of the, of the judge. So, you know, Islam protects the society, <coughs> protects the family system, and protects people and their rights, and that's why the, uh, you know, it, it has to have that type of uh, testimony. So anyways, going on, so uh, I said there was two um, punishments, the 80 lashes. So with regards to these um, 80 lashes, uh, the Hamna radhal anha, Mistah radhal an, uh, Hassan ibn Thabit radhal an, he was also the poet of the Prophet uh, a famous Sahabi, uh, I'm sure everyone knows of his poetry and everything. He was also one of those who was caught up in this. Uh, they were given 80 lashes. And... Uh, uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay, the one who started the whole thing, he was also given those lashes. According to some ulama, some ulama say that perhaps he wasn't. Allah alam, but uh, most likely he was also given because he was the one, everyone saw him, everyone actually heard him when he first started the rumor. When Aisha radhan anha and Safan ibn Ma'atal radhan when they approached the, uh, the camp and they came in and that's when he said his evil and filthy words so uh, Allah alam but he was also given those 80 lashes now a person who is accused can forgive those people so re- in regards to had of uh, zina uh, that's something to do with Allah subhanahu wa that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's right and that's something that will not be taken no one can forgive that that's something if it's proven they have to carry out the had. You have to stone the person. Uh, but in regards to the false accusation, the qadh, the person who was accused, if they find it in their heart to forgive these accusers, then they can do that. Uh, number two, the thing, uh, the second uh, punishment is that their evidence and testimony will not be taken until the end of their lives. Now, Imam Hanifa Rahmullah says that 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 is in case from the ayah up to the end of the day, they're not going to be taken um, forever. And the other ulama, some like Imam Shafi Rahmullah, other ulama, they say that after repentance, after they have done repentance, then their testimony can be taken if they are upright Muslims. So uh, that's the punishment of qadf. Now, in these ayat that were revealed, uh, one of the uh, one of the ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that why didn't the people say when they heard about this that this is buhtanun azim, this is a great lie, this is a great slander, how can people say such a thing? And the, uh, basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that we should, this is what, when we hear something like this, we should initially, uh, you know, we should try to, because we have to stay away from backbiting, we should not be doing that, especially if it's uh, a righteous person, a righteous Muslim. 
okay and uh, even if it's not if it's someone else but we have to stay away from spreading uh, false truth and you know Mulan Sohail just mentioned this yesterday how people just spread stuff all over the internet and you get something on your on your um, whatsapp account and you just forward it to all the groups and all the people that you know without even seeing and verifying the information so we have to protect ourselves from this and uh, it's mentioned that Abu Ayyub and Saudi the famous Sahabi uh, and his wife Umm Ayyub uh, that Abu Ayyub was in his house uh, he was the one, they were the ones who um, hosted the Prophet for seven months in their house and and during this incident, Abu Ayyub at one point when he was in his house and the wife comes home and she says, did you hear what people are saying? And he says, what, what happened? She said that people are saying that Aisha anha did this and that. So she says it to her husband and Abu Ayyub right then he says to her, he says that, uh, he says to his wife, he says that, tell me, would you do such a thing? Tell me, would you do such an act? And she said, no, I, would, I swear I would never do something. So she, he said that Aisha Radhan is better than you. So how could you even think that she could do something? Like so he said, just leave it. This is a lie. This is Bhutan. This, so we leave it. So they stayed away from They protected themselves from that. Uh, going on in the same hadith, Safan ibn Mu'attal uh, uh, Aisha Radhan, she mentions, just want to check. Okay, 20. So, um, Safan ibn Mu'attal Radhalan, Aisha Radhalanha, she says that this man, meaning Safan Radhalan, it was what was said about him. Uh, also, he would respond by saying, Subhanallah, like Subhanallah, like how could they, glory, glory be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that I have never, uh, uh, how would say, I would never, I have never touched a woman. And this member, he had he had not been, he was not married at that time. They said, I have never uh, undressed, even like even seen the shoulder of a woman. I have not even touched a woman. Uh, and then she says later on, he was even shaheed. He was killed in one of the battles. Uh, so Safan so, ibn Mu'attal. Uh, one thing I did want to add about him. So there's a hadith that is found where his wife, so later on he did get married, and his wife actually has three complaints against him. And I just want to you know, clarify this because, um, again, if you, if you look at the hadith itself, uh, and read the hadith, and that's why we have to be very careful not to read just the English translation of a hadith and just, uh, you know, just un- try to understand it that way. We have to sit with the ulama and listen to their explanation and read the explanation, and then you'll understand, you know, the, the reason why something was said and, and whatnot. So anyways, there's three, uh, three complaints that the wife of Safwan Radharan had against him. And she came with she came with her husband to the Prophet ﷺ, and she said three complaints. So these complaints, she said, number one is that when I'm re- reciting the Quran, so I'm reciting the Quran, I'm reading, for example, the, um, Nafal prayer, and she says I, I want to recite long ayat and I want to you know enjoy my salah. But Safwan, he basically uh, one you could say is poking me or he he's like telling me to like to shorten my prayer. And that's one. Complaint. The second complaint, she says that I want to fast. And when I fast, a lot of times he tells me to break my fast. So he forces me to break my fast. And then she said the third complaint is that he doesn't pray Fajr until the very end, when the sun is about to rise, and sometimes he might even miss the prayer. So she says this complaint, and if you think of this, like what? This is Safwan Radhalan, and you know, this is Sahabi, and he's doing this. What's the reason behind this? Now we're going to the explanation. That's why I said it's very important to understand the explanation. So Rasulullah Shasam turns to Safan Radhaan. He says, uh, "What's your response to these, to these, um, uh, these um, complaints?" And Safan Radhaan he says, "We know that uh, it's not mentioned in the Hadith actually at all, but we know that he was one of those who was working as a, he was working as a, um, uh, you know, when they have a well and you have to pull out the well, water from the well." I don't know what you would call that, but just say someone who would physically pull the water from the well. So you would pull it out and then uh, fill up jugs or fill up, you know, whatever. They didn't have machinery at that time, so you had to do everything physically yourself. So Safan Radhan would do that, and they would do this at night. 
because of the heat, also because of people you know, need, coming to the water well and taking water and, and whatnot. So he would do this at night, he would work at night, and many times he would work the entire night, or half the night, or a large part of the night, and he would be so exhausted that he would fall asleep. So you know, we can imagine ourselves, when we sleep at like 12 o'clock, for example, or 1 o'clock, okay, and we f- feel so tired in the morning, it's very difficult to get up for Fajr. And, you know, uh, uh, some people, for example, miss Fajr altogether. They get up, you know, especially the youth, you know, they like to sleep at like 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, and then they're getting up at like Zohar time. Uh, I know some students of mine were telling me how they were staying up all night, praying Fajr and then sleeping up to almost Asr time, getting up and doing Asr and stuff like that. So when, during the break of Tarkama. So, um, so these, this Sahabi, he would work all night and he would be totally exhausted. And they said that sometimes he would even fall asleep right there next to the well. That's how he would even be able to go home. He would just be so exhausted, he would just lay down and fall asleep right there. And this is something like, I'll give you a personal thing that happened to me one time. Is, uh, I remember we did Umrah once and uh, it was a very hot day. And I was, it was after traveling from Medina, driving from Medina to Makkah and Mukarramah, then doing Umrah, and I was tired. And uh, I, I remember we were waiting for someone to come to finish or come out or we were going to meet or something. So, you know, in the white tiled area of the Haram, it's daytime too. I just laid down and I just fell asleep. I, I was so tired and exhausted. I just fell asleep right there on the ground on the hard tile. And I, I think I got a good 10, 15 minute rest and... And then finally they came and we left. But I'm just saying, for example, that someone who's very exhausted, they don't know where, they don't care if it's on the hard floor or where they are, they'll fall asleep. And it's very difficult for them to wake up. So that's one of the things that they say also, as Safwan Radhan was, uh, when the battles or when they would be traveling, Safwan Radhan would be told to stand in the back or come in the back because he would wake up late. It would be hard for him to get up. So they would... Uh, he would be the one following the army and picking up anything that was lost, lost items. So, Safwan uh, knowing that his background now, that he would be working all night, that was the reason. So he says that, uh, you know, when she's reading large uh, rakat and, and tajr time, for example, or, or whatnot, and uh, during the daytime, for example, when he is home, then he says that I am a young man and I have urges, I have desires, so he wanted his wife to basically cut the, the, the surah or the, the nawafil short. Also, the second complaint, that he forces his wife to break her fast. So remember, he's working all night, so he doesn't see his wife at night. And then in the daytime, if she's fasting, and he has, an, you know, he has a desire, so he tells his wife that, you know, break your fast. And Rasulullah actually responded to the wife saying about this, that... Uh, a wife should not fast, nawafil fast, except with the permission of her husband. So this is actually in the hadith. Uh, and then the third complaint was that he would be almost, in the, uh, you know, at the end, Rasulullah Islam, knowing his situation, he said to him that pray when you get up, uh, basically pray when you get up. So this is again that when you're in circum- certain circumstances, when you're not able to control to control the getting up, and it's very difficult to, for you to get up, uh, especially people who work the night shift. I'm sure anyone here, if you know the night shift, it, it changes your whole sleeping patterns and everything, and it's very difficult to get any rest in the day and, and whatnot. Um, so, uh, so that was basically the responses uh, to these to these uh, claims or these uh, complaints uh, that the wife had against Safwan Radhalan. I just wanted to bring that, uh, inshallah, so we have that perspective. So he later on became a shaheed and died in a battle. Uh, some points of benefits, inshallah, I want to take from the hadith. Just wanted to add some added benefits, inshallah. So, number one, don't consider things, don't, the, Allah subhanahu says in these, ayah, in these ayat, that don't consider this as bad, but it is a blessing for you. This is actually good for you. And we know there's an ayah where Allah subhanahu says in Surah Baqarah, that you perhaps you may dislike something and it is good for you. Or the other way around, you perhaps you dislike something, uh, sorry, perhaps you like something and it is good for you. 
uh, it is not good for you. Okay, sorry. So perhaps you dislike something and it is actually khair for you. It is good for you. And perhaps you like something but it's actually shar for you. It's not good for you. So we need to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his hikmah, in his wisdom, he knows what's good and bad for us. So whatever happens, uh, comes our way, we should take it as that inshallah ta'ala. And uh, the hadith, uh, you know, where the Prophet says, عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ mu'min in أَمْرَهُ كُلَّهُ لَهُ خير. Oh, come across, I assume that uh, amazing is the affair of the believer, that everything is good for the moment. That if something difficult comes his way and they have sabr, then the person gets ajr for that. And if something good comes that way, the person's way and they do shukr, then that's also written as good for that person. Also, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests those who, we, who He loves. So not only was this a huge test for Aisha radhan anha, this was also a huge test for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because of his ghayra. Any husband uh, would hear anything like this, they would go and attack that person who would said said such and such about their wife, uh, and they wouldn't have you know patience. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam over thirty days passed. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was very patient, and this even though he was very distress and he was you know in grief and uh, he didn't know what, what to say or do uh, in regarding them because there was no wahi he was not being uh, told what uh, the result but we see how the Prophet had his patience so uh, in regarding to the ghayra of the Prophet we know that Sa'd ibn Ubadah so Sa'd ibn Ubadah from the Khazar side the one who was uh, apparently um, defending again he wasn't defending um, the honor of Abdullah bin Ubay because everyone knew he was an open munafiq but he only said his words because he was from the same tribe as him from the Banu Khazraj so that's why he basically was saying that you can't kill him and Sa'ad ibn Ubad it's well known about him that he had a lot of ghayra in him uh, and this is protective jealousy in English you could say and so he had a lot of ghayra or ghira, it's also mentioned. So uh, Sa'ad ibn Ubad Radhan, he would never marry a woman that was previously married. Okay, so he always would marry a virgin. He would never marry someone who was previously married. And they say that even after he would, if he divorced anyone, no one would dare marry that woman because of the ghira of Sa'ad Radhan. They knew how much he was protective. So even though he has divorced her, they, would, they wouldn't marry that woman because they would know that uh, Sa'ad Radhan, the Ghira of Sa'ad Radhan. And Rasulullah uh, at, um, at one point he says in the hadith, he says, Are you amazed by the Ghira of Sa'ad ibn Ubad Radhan? He says that I have more Ghira than him. I have more Ghira than him. So again, the Prophet was tested this much, and his wife, uh, Radhan Anha, our mother, is being blamed like this, and he was being very patient. So that's another thing we learn from this. Uh, also, we know that others in the past. And in the future, this always happens, were accused like Aisha radhal anha. So for example, Yusuf alayhi salam, he was accused of, of uh, adultery or he was accused of zina. And what happened was, uh, uh, not of zina, but he was accused of being of trying to force himself on the wife of Aziz. And we know that a baby spoke. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused a baby to speak, where the baby said, if look at his qameez. If his qameez is ripped from the front, then he is guilty. And she tells the truth. And if it's ripped from the back, then she is guilty and he tells the truth. So this is uh, how he was protected. He was basically that, but he was still thrown in the jail uh, as a result. We know Maryam alayhi salam. Uh, this is a miracle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, caused her to become pregnant without any man. So she became pregnant without any marriage or any man. No man had touched her. And then she was commanded to take the baby back to her people. Not to go somewhere else, but she was commanded to go back to her people carrying her child. So she went back and they said all kinds of things like, Ya Ukhta Harun, you know, like how could you do such a thing? Your parents were, were very good people, they were pious people. How could you do such a thing? How could you do, and A'udhu Billah, do this sin? And, uh, you know, we, say, we know how Maryam, uh, Islam, how disturbed she was, distressed she was. She says, I wish I was a forgotten thing. Not only just a forgotten, something, a, something that was forgotten and a forgotten that was forgotten. So she says, I forgot, uh, I, she wishes, she was like that. And uh, she was also uh, absolved when the baby spoke. So her own child, uh, Isa alayhi salam, spoke up and said, Inni Abdullah. And basically, you know, saying that this is, I, I have been sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And she, she was absolved 
uh, of that sin. Also, Juraj, uh, الله, you could say, uh, عن, he's one of the people from Banu Israel, and there's a famous hadith where the Prophet tells about the story of Juraj. I'm not going to go into detail, but he basically, uh, his mother said a uh, badua against him, and he was about to be executed, and then uh, the child of the woman who accused him of zina spoke up. He says, he talks to the child and says, who is your father? And the child spoke and said that my father is the farmer. So that was another incident that happened and now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the innocence of Aisha anha by sending down uh, ayat in the Quran. Uh, another um, benefit we can take from this, from this incident is that we should always strive to be the accused and not the accuser. Not accusing anybody else. But if we are accused, then that there's no, there's no harm in that. There's you know I'm not saying ask Allah subhanahu wa taala you know someone accuses us, but if someone accuses you in safayat, that that is what we should um, be and never be the accuser. And there's a famous um, hadith, uh, the same one where Juraj uh, rahimahullah is mentioned, uh, where there was a woman she was suckling her child, and uh, this man came on a faris came. He was riding a horse, and uh, he had uh, basically he was he had a lot, he looked wealthy and he looked like he had a man of honor and whatnot. And she makes a dua. She says, "Allah majal." Excuse me. So she says, "O oh Allah, make Ibni make my son mithlahad al rakib. Make my son like this man." And uh, the child again, this child who was of suckling age is not it's impossible to speak. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the impossible possible. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him speech. He was able to speak. The child uh, started to speak and says, Oh Allah, he starts looking at the rock. He starts looking at this man. And the child says, Oh Allah, don't make me like this man. Then later on, and the, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the mother was amazed. Like what, what's this, this child is speaking. And then after a little while, uh, so the, the child went back to suckling the mother. And then the ch- another woman was coming. And people were chasing her. They were stoning her. They were cursing her, beating her up, pushing her down and, and whatnot. And this mother seeing this woman being treated like this, she says, Allahumma la taj'al la taj'al ibni. Mithla hadi hadi al ama. Don't make my child like this slave girl. Like don't make don't make him like that. And don't let him go through this this type of harassment or this type of punishment. And this child uh, 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 stops suckling and looks starts looking at this ama. Starts looking at this slave girl and he says, Allah majalni mithla hadi al ama. Oh Allah, make me like her. So this mother. Then she says, okay, this is enough. So she turns to the child and she says, oh child, that when this Raqib came and this man, wealthy man came and stuff, and I made dua that, oh Allah, make you like him. You said, don't make me like him. And now this woman comes who's being pushed and shoved and, and she's being stoned and, and whatnot, and curses being uh, thrown against her. And you're saying that, make me like her? Like, well, how does this make sense? Give me an answer. Like, what, what does this mean? And the, the child speaks a response to the mother, saying, Ya Umma, O oh my mother, in the Raqib Jabbarun min al Jabbabira. That, that this Raqib, he's actually one of the tyrants from the, amongst the tyrants. He is one of the Jabbar min al Jabbabira. Wa inna hadi al Amma. And this slave girl, Yaqulun Sarakat Walam Tasriq. So the men, the people, uh, sorry, not the men, but the, the people of the tribe or whatever, they're accusing her that she stole and she did not steal. She actually is innocent, but she's being accused of stealing. وَلَمْ تَسْرِقْ وَيَقُولُونَ زَنَتْ وَلَمْ تَزْنِي And she's being told that you also, that she has committed adultery, that she did zina, and she has not committed zina. Walam tazni again, again. She, he was given. This child is given this information from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Walam tazni wa hiya taqul hasbi Allah. And the only response that she's saying, hasbi Allah, Allah is enough for me. Meaning Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows my condition. He knows if I'm innocent or not. Uh, another uh, example or a benefit we could say from this, we know that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in Surah Al Hajarat, Ayah number twelve, wala tajassu wala wala yagta baadukum baada. That you should not spy on each other and you should not backbite each other. 
ايحب احدكم ان ياكل لحم اخيه ايحب احدكم ان ياكل لحم اخيه ميتا فكرهتمو that would one of you wish to eat the flesh the dead flesh or the flesh of your dead brother or sister no certainly you would dislike that you would hate to do that you would be disgusted by that wattaqullah inna allah tawwabur rahim so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that basically the similitude of backbiting is like a dead body you eating from a dead body and there's a hadith that are similar to this ayah where for example um uh, maiz al aslami radiyallahu anhu he was one of the sahaba and he was the one famous for anybody know what was he famous for maiz al aslami radiyallahu anhu he was a sahabi that was uh, given rujum he was the one who was he had committed adultery he had committed zina and he himself came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because he felt so uh, sorrowful and regretful for what he did even though allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had covered his sin no one knew what he had but he himself came and he said four times to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam basically that i have committed he says zanait i have committed zina so uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, ordered them to to do rujum to do uh, rajam um, stoning of this man of the sahabi radiyallahu an so maiz al aslami radiyallahu an uh, it's it's mentioned that while he was being um, stoned the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam heard two men they were talking rajulain min ashabihi so two sahaba were talking they were saying yaqul ahaduma li sahibi one of them said to the other unzur ila hadha alladhi satara allah alayhi falam tad'a falam tad'ahu nafsu hatta rujima rajma al kalb so the sahabi says to the other he says look at this man that he was allah subhanahu wa ta'ala covered his and no one knew about his sin but his soul his self his 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 self could not stop him uh, he could not you know he didn't feel good about himself that he actually went and told the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and admitted to doing this and now he was given rujum he was given he's he's being stoned like the stoning of a dog so they said these words to each other the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam heard them say this فَسَكَدَ عَنْهُمَا So the Prophet ﷺ did not respond, did not say anything. And they were walking. So now they're, as they're walking, they pass by مِنْ حَتَّى مَرَّ بِجِيفَةِ حِمَارٍ So they found a donkey where its legs were up in the air. It's dead. It's basically died or whatever happened to it. And you know the, when an when a animal dies, especially on the street, for you know, deers, we see a lot of deers on the roads and stuff like that. or raccoons and what not so when they die their legs are up and and you see the body is has almost like doubled inside because uh, what i'm sorry decomposing well before they decompose the body becomes flared up because of the the you know the and then the smell of the animal and what not so they saw this himar this this um, donkey was laying that like this and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says aina fulanun wa fulan where are those two sahaba so it's not mentioned the names of these two sahaba but the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says where are those two men so they come forth this is we're here now we, you know ya rasulullah we're here and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says inzila fukula min jifati hadha al himar that go down and eat from the flesh of this himar eat from the flesh of this donkey this dead uh, this dead donkey and they said respond saying faqala ya nabi allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam man ya'kul min hadha that who would eat from this like it's so disgusting and it's like even if someone's hungry they wouldn't eat from this and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam responded by saying fama lin uh, fama niltuma min irdi akhikum akhikuma he said that what you what you um what you hit what you have taken you know like uh, basically from from your from the from the izza or from the the hurma of your of your brother ani for me like what you just said what you just said a couple of minutes ago or a little while ago what you said about your brother ashadda min akli bin that what you said about your brother is worse than eating from this eating from this dead body and then the prophet sallallahu said والذي نفسي بيدي i swear by the one who, in whose hand is my soul انه الان لفي انهار الجنه ينغمس فيها او كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم that this man meaning ma'iz radhan he is in the rivers of jannah swimming therein and this is because his tawba was so strong that he allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had forgiven him Uh, another example and again just a few more things inshallah uh, another example there's a uh, there's a hadith where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was traveling 
and there was they were fasting, and uh, a man comes up to the Prophet ﷺ and says that there's two women who are about to die from thirst. Okay, they're about to die from thirst because they were fasting and they're traveling and they were having extreme thirst. So the, this man says the Prophet ﷺ ignores him. He comes back a second time and then a third time. And then the Prophet ﷺ says, bring them forward. So they come and the Prophet ﷺ says they get like a bucket or a cup or, some, or know, like a bowl or something. And the Prophet ﷺ says, says, vomit into this. Vomit into this thing. And they, the people said, well, they didn't eat anything all day. They're fasting and they're, di- they're dying of thirst, almost dying of thirst. So, you know, it's impossible that they have anything to, even to, to vomit out. The Prophet ﷺ says, vomit. So when they vomit, pieces of flesh and blood and all this stuff comes out into this bowl or into this bucket. And the people are amazed. At these women, they didn't eat anything the whole day and they're dying of thirst. How are they? It's even possible of anything coming out. And basically the Prophet ﷺ says that because these women, they did siyam from the halal and they ate from that was haram, meaning that they were doing ghiba. So they were talking to each other, they were talking about someone and that's why this, this uh, basically this blood and guts and whatever was in, put, placed in their st- stomach, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did this to warn the others. Now another thing and I'll end with this, one more uh, benefit, point of benefit inshallah is don't follow the faults of others. So like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا do not you know, spy on people and do not follow the faults. Uh, the Prophet says in the hadith uh, that, O oh, the people who have believed with their tongues and the, heart, the iman has not entered into their hearts yet, لا تغطاب لا, لا المسلمين Do not backbite the Muslimin ولا تتبعوا عوراتهم And do not follow the faults of others فإنه من اتبع عوراتهم يتبع, يتبع Sorry, يتبع الله uh, Sorry, يتبع الله عورته That when you follow the faults of others Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala As a result, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will follow your faults ومن يتبع الله وَمَنْ يَتَّبْعِ اللَّهُ أَوْرَتَ يَفْدَحْهُ فِي بَيْتِي أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم And the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala follows their faults Then even if they're in the middle of their house And they're in the sanctity of their house Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expose them And they will be for, for, all, for all to see Meaning their, their faults will be exposed to the people So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Give us a tawfiq inshallah to understand these lessons And implement them in our lives And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Give us a tawfiq inshallah to act in accordance to the Quran and Sunnah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give our wives, our mothers, our uh, daughters, uh, our sisters, and, uh, and, uh, and the women of this ummah to act upon the Quran and Sunnah, inshallah ta'ala. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wassalamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.